We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquillity, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. is responsible under our system of government for promoting the general welfare. When the framers set out to construct a government, they were interested in a government that divided power between federal and state sovereigns, but they were very concerned about a intrusive national power. And so the construct that of the federal constitution divides power between the federal and the state government. The Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. If the activity that Congress is interested in is not on this list of enumerated powers, then Congress lacks the power to regulate that activity directly. But what it cannot regulate directly, it may be able to impact through the spending clause. Congress has the authority to distribute wealth, a great deal of wealth but it can attach conditions. For example, the federal government lacks the authority to regulate the drinking age in the states. And this has been considered historically a state power, right? But here's what Congress can do. Congress can say to the states, we will give you money to build and maintain your highways. But in order to get that money, you have to raise the drinking age to 21. To regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Commerce Clause is the, the little enumerated power that turned into a monster and basically has swallowed up many social policy issues. The Federal Civil Rights Acts are promulgated under the Commerce Clause because the Congress lacks authority to regulate for civil rights in and of itself, affirmatively for private party behavior, and so they used the Commerce Clause. And in the 60s, the court accepted that. I'm not sure they would today. Uh, some of the states have failed to regulate pollution, and that was the consensus in the six, late 60s and early 70s that led to the passage of uh, federal environmental laws in air, water, waste disposal, um, and a variety of other in environmental areas. Justice Marshall said in a famous opinion, we must never forget it's a constitution we are expounding. It's not a specific list of regulations. It's a document of principles and values. It may be that the court, as it is increasingly willing to see limits on the Commerce Clause after many decades of seeing almost no limits, is more inclined to take another look at the Spending Clause. Maybe there's a point at which the federal government cannot extract certain dramatic conditions that would be very disruptive on the states. Historically, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison argued that the spending clause only authorized the federal government to spend in relation to their enumerated powers. And Alexander Hamilton said, no, of course not. They can spend for anything they want. And his view prevailed and has prevailed historically.